Hi, Tyler. Hey, Carl. Good to uh, talk with you. Yeah, you too. Um, let me uh, introduce myself to everybody. Uh, my name's Carl Zimmer. Uh, I'm a science writer and a pretty frequent uh, appearer on uh, Blogging Heads. And Tyler, want you to introduce yourself. Okay. Tyler Volk, and I'm a professor of biology and environmental studies at NYU. I direct the science part of the environmental studies program. Uh, I've been a long-time researcher in the global carbon cycle, uh, research for NASA and closed ecological life support systems, and also have dealt with uh, human energy systems in the future. So, uh, Tyler, I'm really glad to be able to have you on uh, because you've got this really interesting new book. I've, I've enjoyed all your books, but uh, your new one I'm going to hold up to the screen is called CO2 Rising, The World's Greatest Environmental Challenge. And um, I find it a really interesting uh, take on global warming uh, coming from someone who, um, who deals with carbon and with global warming on the kind of huge time scales that uh, most people aren't familiar with. And, and so you put our current situation with climate change into this really fascinating kind of big picture context. Um, I, I thought maybe it, it would be um, good to kind of start out by talking about some of your previous work that kind of led you up to working on this book. Um, you deal with um, long, long-term changes in levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in long-term changes in climate on the planet. Maybe you could just t talk a bit about the kind of research that you've, that you've done in that area. Uh, okay, Carl. Well, some of my research has involved uh, the oceans and atmosphere-ocean exchange of, of carbon dioxide and then what happens once carbon gets into the ocean and how plankton distributes it. And that moved me into some work regarding the way that evolutionary changes in life on large scales, me meaning large biogeochemical taxonomic changes in the kinds of creatures that live on Earth, how these sorts of changes could have affected atmospheric carbon dioxide in the geological past, say with increasing the weathering rates of the soil with the coming of land plants uh, around 400 million years ago, or the redistribution of the burial of carbon in the ocean via carbonate sediments with, uh, with calcareous plankton, uh, looking at sort of big dynamics uh, of, of the biosphere. And my original interest in carbon did come about because of concerns with the increasing levels of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere due to human activities uh, really coming out of the environmental movement, uh, also interested in, in energy systems. And so with this book, I am trying to uh, you know, really bring the carbon cycle to everyone uh, many of the books that are out there about global warming are focused on climate itself, which is the, the real concern given uh, melting of ice sheets or changes in temperature. But that is being driven by the increasing levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, and I've found that it's a good avenue to understanding the changes that are happening to go into the carbon cycle because it's such a more it's more materially tangible in a certain way than climate, which uh, has a lot of a um, lot of variables that are being driven by the changes in atmospheric CO two. So I really wanted to cover the carbon cycle. The and, carbon, and, and the, I love the carbon cycle. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think people. I don't think many people know what the carbon cycle is. I mean, I think people are starting to become aware that, that carbon dioxide is this greenhouse gas that, that uh, can raise the, uh, the temperature of the atmosphere. But, um, but, yeah, we tend to think of carbon as just something that... Carbon dioxide is something we are just injecting into the atmosphere like some, some new pollutant. Um, but it, you point out in your book, it's, it's more complicated in that, in the sense that, that you know, carbon dioxide is, is in this constant cycle, uh, going, 
into the atmosphere, in, into the oceans, back out again, into the soil, into everything. Um, and it, it's it's hard, I think, for people to to uh, to appreciate that. But I, mean, I think maybe your book will be able to help. I mean, what, one thing I, I thought was interesting was um, where you were talking about how um, how carbon atoms get so mixed up. Um, very quickly. I mean, you talk about how... Um, now, let me make sure I have this right. Like, every leaf that you see might have an atom of carbon that you exhaled. Do I have that right? Yeah, it's, yeah you're very close, Carl. Yes, uh, it's even a little bit more dramatic than that. Uh, so, so we we are carbon-burning beings, just mm-hmm. like the automobile or uh, a coal-burning power plant, but we burn the carbon that's in the food we eat. Mm-hmm. And then when we, we, we combust that into carbon dioxide, it's, it's a waste product in our bodies. And so, as everyone knows, we exhale that. You know, we exhale CO2, and you better not be around too much of your exhalation or you're going to suffocate on your own waste gas. Uh, but our waste gas is an essential nutrient to all the plants, all the photosynthesizers, all the plankton in the ocean uh, get some, more than 99% of the CO2 that they use from, from the respirers that, that put out the CO2. We do that, and the birds do it, and the bacteria in the soil do it as well. Mm-hmm. And so I became interested, you know, what happens to the CO2 from, from one of our exhalations? Where would you have to go to find this, let's say, in a, in a forest somewhere? Because our, our one exhalation is not that is not that much, and it goes into the vast atmosphere and starts mixing around. And I did the calculation. It turns out that uh, if you exhale, let's say we're exhaling, you are exhaling right now. I'm exhaling, and this exhalation is going into the atmosphere. By next spring, it's pretty much pretty much mixed all around, uh, close to being mixed all around the planet. And the leaves that are going to grow, either in Connecticut or New York State or Europe, even the, the tropical rainforest, each leaf is going to have an average size leaf, and on the order about 50 atoms of carbon in it from each exhalation that you are making right now and that I am making right now. So, wow. so it's an extraordinary fact, I think, that, that the CO2 from our exhalations, from every exhalation we make, some of those carbon atoms go out as CO2, circulate around the atmosphere, and will end up from that single exhalation in virtually every single leaf on the planet that grows in approximately the next year. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're networked out with the biogeochemical webs of, of, of all of life. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was astounded myself uh, when I did this calculation. Yeah, and and so I guess um, what you have to start figuring out when you're looking at the at the um, carbon cycle is, I mean, you, you obviously can't uh, track the carbon cycle down to every breath and every leaf and so on. So I guess you have to to start looking at these these big uh, parts of the biosphere where carbon is is. Uh, Entering and then coming out, like like the oceans or, or plants in general. I mean, how how do you make sense of the carbon cycle if these atoms are getting mixed together so much all the time? Yeah, so you, you had it right. You have to pool, you have to put together parts of uh, parts of the biosphere uh, into these large uh, collected um, parcels. You you, know, you might say the ocean. Uh, it, it, and by the way, the, by the biosphere, I think you and I are using the term in the same way. We're, we're, we're talking about the surface system, not just the organisms. I would normally call those the biota, the, the mm-hmm. sum of all creatures. But the biosphere is normally referring to the atmosphere, ocean, all, all organisms, and the soil. And these are the mi- four main parts, atmosphere, ocean, soil, and organisms or life that are in fairly rapid exchange with each other in terms of the chemical exchanges that happen between these various parts. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so, yeah, you're right. You have to figure out what the exchanges are. And just the fact that our breath goes out and immediately becomes part of leaves uh, over the next few years, and some of, some of the CO2 molecules from our exhalations also go into the ocean and mm-hmm. start going down into the water. Uh, and, and so it all starts getting mixed in. And this is very important for, for figuring out what happens to the fossil fuel emissions of CO2 because those are, uh, that go into the atmosphere, they also start circulating into the other parts of the biosphere. And how quickly they do that and what happens to them is of very much important, it's very important to predicting the, the CO2 levels in the future. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. so the way, the way the human breath comes in, uh, I, I like to use the human breath as a, clear example of, of one of the cycles within the biosphere because you're, you're already alluding to the fact that this the material such as carbon circulates around and so it's it's going through these sub-cycles within the large, what we call the, the global carbon cycle. Uh, these sub-cycles, uh, it, the, when you breathe out CO2, when I breathe out CO2, it's, it's, it's coming from some food uh, that I ate um, you know, within the last day generally and that came from either an animal or a plant. If you track it back, it had to come from a plant in some kind of form. And then that was back in the atmosphere as you track it back in time as CO2. So it's, it, it started as CO2 in the atmosphere. And within you know, pretty much the last year, depending on how, you know, if you, how long you've stored the food before you eat it, uh, but let's say you know, generally we're talking a year or two even for the grains that we eat, uh, that CO2 that we exhale was in the atmosphere as, as CO2, and so this makes it sort of you can think, you can think well, human exhalations. There's 6.7 billion people on the planet. We're all exhaling. Is this somehow increasing the CO2 of the atmosphere? And the answer is is no, because that CO2 we're exhaling, the carbon in that CO2 we're exhaling went through our bodies as food, but came through plants and came from the atmosphere not too long ago. Mm-hmm. And so that's just part of a cycle. So there's, there's no net change in the atmosphere. That's carbon going into the atmosphere that came from the atmosphere as CO2. Uh, there's, there's no net change. And this is the, the kind, of, uh, kind of fundamental understanding I, I, hope to, I, I hope to really get across in, in my outreach about the global carbon cycle. Yeah, well, in the book, um, you you have all these great examples of um, all the different paths that a carbon atom could take. It might be in a limestone cliff for a few thousand years and then get weathered out. It might end up in uh, a glass of beer. Um, Somebody might uh, release some carbon from a stick because they're they're, um, trying to keep themselves warm with a fire. Um, And so... um, it really <clears throat> shows just um, all the different uh, incarnations that, that carbon can can take, and 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 you know it, it's interesting how you know some of these things can make a difference to the climate or or not, all depending on how you know, how fast these cycles are going and how fast carbon's going into the atmosphere and how fast it's going out. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I I'm sort of you know it it. it is really striking reading all this to, to think about um, just how powerful an effect um, life has had on the climate, you know, for billions of years by just, you know, just because we're, you know, carbon-based organisms, you know, bacteria too, or, or, or plants. Um, uh, I mean, what are, what are some of, like, the big uh, chapters in sort of the history of Earth's climate uh, that have been affected by, by life? I mean, how has life kind of controlled the climate um, be- before humans got on the scene and started really taking charge? Okay, well, the, the big overall effect, uh, which is work I did, um, a lot of it in collaboration with David Schwartzman of Howard University, is, is, is gradual cooling of the planet over long periods of time due to the increased reactions in the soils from what we call the biotic enhancement of weathering. 
So there has been an overall trend as the continents have become populated with more and more complex forms of life to create soils and therefore soil conditions in which increased chemical reactions are happening. And these chemical reactions in the soils uh, remove or liberate various ions in the, in the soil minerals, uh, the most important of which for this discussion is calcium. And that calcium that gets liberated from the soil minerals goes into rivers and into the ocean where the ocean creatures precipitate that calcium out as calcium carbonate. And so the carbonate part of that molecule uh, that goes into eventually into rocks such as, uh, well, the, the big one would be limestone that covers a fairly large percentage of the, of the continents now that formed in marine conditions. That limestone is, is, is calcium carbonate, and so when that calcium went out, it carried a carbon in the form of carbonate ion with it. And uh, the, these, these reactions are affected by the atmospheric CO2, and if there's biological impacts on the rates of those reactions in the soil, if those reactions are going faster due to uh, life-created conditions in the soil, the steady-state atmospheric CO2 will be lower. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so originally you had the bacterial colonization of the continents, and then you had more complex uh, algae-dominated uh, soils with eukaryotic cells, complex nucleated cells, and then eventually the, the evolving of, of large land plants and, mm-hmm. and trees that could hold the soil. And these, these have been sort of stepwise changes in this biotic enhancement of weathering. Mm-hmm. There's other factors too, such as uh, what's happened with plate tectonics and volcanic emissions of CO2. Uh, th- those also come into play in the models that, uh, that we do. Uh, but, but overall, the impacts of life uh, have on, on the carbon cycle, even though there's some opposite effects as well, the general trend has been uh, cooling the planet over very, very long uh, time histories. Mm. Interesting how we're, uh, we're now reversing that trend. You know, we, we seem to be kind of unusual as, as organisms go because we're, we're, we're putting carbon back in the atmosphere and, and, um, and, and raising the temperature. Yeah, kind of, kind of super volcanoes. <laughs> right. You know, volcanoes, yeah, volcanoes are, or the liberation of carbon uh, by natural processes such as volcanic emissions and the, uh, the weathering of, of these carbonate rocks that releases fresh carbon into, into the biosphere system. Uh, we're, we're the humans, humanity as a whole is now a factor of 20 uh, uh, greater than this natural release. So, so, we're, we're we're really, so we're releasing about t- uh, uh, carbon at a rate about 20 times higher than um, nature was releasing before. Is that correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. So it's not as if the surface is in a perfect cycle, as, as you spoke about uh, earlier. Uh, th- these are these are systems of exchanges at various time scales, and this biosphere system that we live within is not perfect. It's it's both leaking or burying carbon down, as I described, as mm-hmm. the carbonate sediments in the ocean, and there's fresh carbon coming in, and so there is a replenishment that happens. But we're we're now uh, 20-fold above that. And that's, that's the, the problem of the increased greenhouse effect in a nutshell, that we've, we've uh, overloaded uh, the natural fluxes that are going into the atmosphere. Mm. So um, so the, the, the natural world is able to absorb some of the extra carbon we're releasing, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, right. it's, it's not like... It's not like all of the carbon that we re- carbon dioxide we release with burning fuel and such um, goes up in the atmosphere and and is in, and stays there. I mean, it the ocean can absorb at least a little of it, right? I mean, it, so it's it's not quite as much as if if uh, life could not absorb some of it. Is that is that is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's perfectly fair, Carl. The the, the ocean uh, is currently about thirty percent of absorbing about 30% of what we put up into the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And, and all told, with land plants kicking in as well, absorbing some, uh, it, it's, it's close to 
Uh, it's, it's, it's close to 50% of what we put into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, depending on whether you include the deforestation or not. You, you can work out these, one can work out these numbers. Uh, there, there's one interesting point that I, I'd like to make along those lines, is that the, uh, the oceans are taking up uh, in, in something on the order of about 100 billion tons of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide each year, and they're re-releasing uh, close to that as well into the atmosphere. The, the, CO2, the CO2 gas uh, is, is going into the ocean and going back into the atmosphere from the atmosphere to the ocean and back into the atmosphere, uh, up and down, uh, just like when you release uh, something, a carbonated beverage, the CO2 is going up into the air. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to get flat, but eventually that CO2 is going in from the air back into your, your drink, and it reaches an equilibrium state, which is flat-tasting mm -hmm. to us. But the gas is going back and forth, and, and that 100 billion uh, tons a year of carbon in the form of CO2 is, uh, is, is more than 10 times greater than the fossil fuel release of carbon in the form of CO2 into the atmosphere. So the flux, the actual natural flux between the atmosphere and the ocean is much greater than, than the fossil fuel release. Mm -hmm. the, 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 these fluxes of the cycles of nature are, are, are actually huge. Uh, and so you might say, gee, there, there'd be no problem. The ocean's taking up so much. But there still is the problem because the ocean is, is also... The, the CO2 is going back, for, back into the atmosphere from the ocean. And so these n cycles naturally are, are very close to being in balance. One can ask how much they have been in balance in the past. And so when we put in our extra, our, our extra increment into the atmosphere, some starts going into the ocean, but now some starts coming back into the atmosphere. And, and so what, what we put up gets diluted relatively quickly, but the dilution is with new stuff from the ocean that still contains the extra, the extra increment we put up in the atmosphere. So when you work all this out, I and mean, you can do it just by empirical observations, but then you want to try, we want to try to understand why to predict the future of, of the system. When mm -hmm. you work all this out, uh, the current world, ocean and land biota, the, in the current world, the natural systems are taking up a net, not, not a gross, but a net of about half of, of what we're putting in. Mm -hmm. So were they not doing that, uh, you know, the, the, the CO2 problem would, in a sense, be sky high. You know, if it's already a concern, everything would be double were, were the systems not doing that. And were the systems taking up far, le uh, far more, excuse me, if they were systems were taking up you know, 90%, then we probably wouldn't be talking about the carbon dioxide problem either. Right. So it's a, sort of an interesting middle ground there where it's still a tremendous cause for concern, and yet we can see the natural systems uh, operating to, to, uh, to really absorb a fairly significant amount of what we've put up into the atmosphere. Right. I, I, I'm reminded of the... Uh, there's this... this uh, Famous curve uh, of that uh, on a graph that shows the um, the rate of increase of CO2 in recent decades um, by um, is that Charles Keeling I guess was the scientist who started it right 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 yeah 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 and C. it's this Keeling or D Dave Keeling Charles Charles David Keeling people uh, close to him used to call him Dave Dave Keeling yes. okay and so this this um, this graph, it, it looks overall like a curve going up, 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 but it's got this uh, remarkable sort of uh, sawtooth pattern along the way, and you write about that in the in the book, and how I just find it uh, really remarkable that, um, uh, you know, as the seasons change and, and plants grow, they, they, they suck um, some of that extra CO2 out of the air every year, and then it just rebounds back again, and it's it's this this incredible kind of it's like a it's like a pulse of 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 plant life that you can see in this graph, and and obviously it's not it's not taking down all of the carbon, but you can still see the the effects of the cycle that you're writing about just even in in these these kinds of graphs. Uh, y y right, Carl. Yeah, it was a, it was an amazing discovery. I mean, Keeling himself was, was amazed. It's one of those things when you start uh, measuring something as complicated as the, the biosphere, you might think you understand it in 
you don't until you see it. And what was discovered in the early 60s when they started measuring atmospheric CO2 directly, snaring it from the atmosphere and, and measuring it, is that between – this was happening in, in, in Hawaii. So they went to the middle of the Pacific Ocean – and from about May till September, sometimes October, depending on the year, but basically May is the high during the year, and between May and September, despite the uh, billions of tons that humanity is putting into the atmosphere during that time period, from May until September, the CO2 in the atmosphere is actually going down, as you point out, with this this sawtooth uh, pattern that happens on the on the main graph, and uh, that's because the vegetation is a, p- a powerful enough carbon sink. Uh, all the northern hemisphere vegetation that has been, uh, in the high latitudes anyway, when there's, there's big high latitude vegetation, that's either been highly reduced during the winter in the case of the taiga and, and the, the conifers, in the boreal forest, or absent in the case of all the deciduous forests that l- lose their leaves and are just sitting there as, as empty trees all winter long. Mm-hmm. When those leaves start leafing out, literally, uh, they're taking CO2 from the atmosphere to build themselves, to build most of their structure, uh, the carbon molecules in the leaves, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignin, and to put it into various proteins of the leaves. And, and the, uh, that th- this, this is a strong enough biospheric flux or, or biospheric uh, process that the CO2 in the entire northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere stay about the same. So the, C- the CO2 globally is, is actually decreasing. Mm. Uh, and, and this again shows the, 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 the tremendous strength of the, of, of the parts of nature that are operating out there. Uh, right now, in November, when you know the trees around where, you know, where where you are in Connecticut, where I am in in New York City, when the trees are all basically uh, you know, the, the naked skeletons again, uh, not only are the are not only uh, is the fossil fuel release of CO two continuing, and not only are we still breathing, but the bacteria in the soil are still. Exhale and not really exhaling, but they're respiring. They're 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 ejecting their CO two yeah. uh, in, into the soil, and that goes up into the atmosphere. And so then, each year, the the highs that are in May are getting a little bit higher, and the lows that are in September are also a little bit higher than they were in each previous year. Mm-hmm. But I but this whole sawtooth pattern, I, I I just people call it the breathing of the biosphere, the breathing of the biota, the the the. But the the, the force of the biota, the force of life on a global scale, impacting, and this still amazes me, impacting the chemistry of the entire atmosphere of Earth, uh, the, 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 their, their, their uptake and release of, of elements can be so great that, that we're talking about uh, not just something you know, barely measurable, but it's a, it's a few percent of the entire carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere is is disappearing into land biota and then getting re-released uh, into the atmosphere uh, every single year. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty remarkable. Well, um, so uh, now why don't we talk now about um, this this carbon cycle in the in the age of humans? I mean, Keeling was documenting this incredible. R- Rise in carbon dioxide, which is now um, uh, raising the the uh, average uh, global temperature. So, um, you know, in in your book, you you um, once you talked about the the way the cycle works, you try to to uh, and the way we're we're um, affecting it now. You try to look into the future, um, and. Uh, it was interesting how you, um, you know, a lot of people have been making a big deal about how China is now pulling ahead um, as like the biggest carbon emitter, and and uh, you make a, a point in your book that that's um, that might be kind of the wrong way to look at the effect that uh, we're having on the planet that that we need to and how we will continue to have an effect that we need to be thinking more about. How much people are releasing per capita? Um, can you explain that a bit more? Uh, 
Yeah, so in the last few years, China has uh, reached the number one spot in uh, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion and cement manufacture ties into that as well because when you make cement, you have to uh, heat off some of the CO2 to make the cement, and that goes into the atmosphere. And that comes into play with China because of the large number of concrete buildings that are being constructed there. Uh, but China has been increasing its, its fossil fuel combustion at a furious rate and has uh, surpassed the U.S., which has been you know, number one for you know, un, you know, almost since fossil fuels were uh, uh, started being used. Uh, as the number one uh, country emitter. So there's a, th and you see this in the news all the time now, you know, China now being number one, maybe China will start realizing it's going to have some responsibility to, uh, to um, uh, reduce its emissions. Uh, right now it, it's, it's exempt from uh, various first agreements in the Kyoto Protocol. Right. Uh, but I, but I, but this, uh, this actually gets me uh, going a little bit because uh, the, per capita emissions in China are still uh, one-fourth or one-fifth what they are in the United States on the per capita basis. And I believe that it's, it's, it's we, we can't, okay, let me step back. Co nations are crucial because nations are individually going to be responsible to make laws internally that affect their development. And so the nations are key as the, as the legal entity on a certain scale for what's going to happen inside uh, the, these various bodies that, that people live within. Uh, but to compare them uh, sort of a, a, you know, country A to country B as if they are somewhat equal entities really, really misses the point. And c not only that, can lead to a kind of logic such as the following. One could say in the, to the, in the, within the United States, why should we do anything in the United States when the number one emitter, China, is saying they are, they are not going to do anything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's unfair. You know, you know, number two does something and number one doesn't do anything. Uh, and it's and you can see the, the ease of that logic, I think. You, you, you start seeing it in, 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 the, in the news and, in, and sometimes even in political speeches, uh, particularly if they want to downplay the responsibility of the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's, it's using language that might be applicable to two people back in the, the Paleolithic that, mm, you know, you, 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 you got a lot of this meat that just got killed and, you know, I got nothing. That's unfair. <laughs> you know, you know, as if the people are too... Uh, are, are, and, and for with people, that's okay because they're two entities of about the same size and about the same metabolic needs. Right. But uh, with countries, uh, you know, China is uh, about four times the population of the United States, so its needs, in a sense, are, are are very much higher. And so, what gets forgotten in these in these discussion this discussions, and it, it, look, it's in there. Everybody knows that China has many more people in the United States and the per capita is lower. Right? You, know, you can see the pictures of what life is like in China compared to the average life in the United, the average life in the United States. Everyone knows that, but it's, there's something about the human brain when these nation-to-nation -nation comparisons get brought up that make it easy to fall into uh, treating these nations almost as if you were treating people and start using the logic of, of fairness and unfairness as if they were two equal metabolic uh, entities. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's of interest that if, if, you, if you take uh, gross domestic product per person, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in per, per, per person, this is the important key parameter, and you take energy consumption per person, and mm -hmm. you look at CO2 emissions per, pers per person, and you, you do it for the United States and compare it to the world, the world average uh, Per person, just set those equal to one for the world average economic wealth per person, the world average energy per person, and the energy consumption per person, and the world average CO2 emissions per person. The United States, on those three parameters, is between four and five times the world average. A person in the United States is mm. between four and five times the world average across the boards on CO2 mm. emissions, energy consumption, and GDP. So it shows the really close link of those of economic wealth, energy consumption, and CO2 emissions. And if you look at China for those three 
Um, it's just about the world average uh, now. You know, mm. It's just reached the world average in CO2 emissions, um, energy consumption per person, and the uh, gross domestic product per person. They, mm -hmm. they vary a little bit how they work out depending on China uses more coal than, than we use, so its CO2 emissions are a little bit higher across across those three than, than, than we are. So uh -huh. that's that, that's interesting also and important. But the, the, the main point is that China is is very close to being, you could regard China as sort of the, the average state of the world. Mm -hmm. right? And right. Uh, in the average state of the world would you know, not be acceptable for the United States. There's no, nobody's going to get elected. Uh, Obama's not going get to get elected uh, uh, because uh, you know he, he, he said we're going to reduce CO2 emissions by going back to the uh, um, average state of the world that we all can live at. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, it, we, we the people in the United States, you know, want more, and this is going to be a huge uh, issue in the coming future. One, one that I actually think has to be dealt with with uh, increasing uh, the economic, the gross world product. I think it's, it's it has to go up to get the world's peoples that are suffering in in dire poverty uh, up to reasonable standards of living. And but we're going to have to do that in ways that are responsible. Both giving us the energy systems that we need that can be sustainable, mm -hmm. and with reduced CO two emissions, and this mm -hmm. is going to be, uh, as is recognized, a, a tremendous challenge. But it's not going to be happen by by uh, you know trying to reduce uh, standard by trying to reduce consumption and reduce uh, economic output. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least I hope we're not. We hope we don't do it because that was a path that happened uh, without choice. You know, let, let's hope that it, it doesn't. Something doesn't terrible happen. Uh, to the world, because then you know, all of us are going to be suffering. Right, right. Well, um, well, do you have uh, thoughts on solutions that that can work or solutions that that won't? Um, I mean, there's such a huge range of uh, ideas that people have. Um, everything from you know changing our sources of energy to these kind of geoengineering schemes where you just grab carbon and put it, you know, down in the deep ocean. Um, you know, how, you know, how do you approach these things as somebody who thinks a lot about the carbon cycle? Yeah. Boy, I'm so tempted to ask you, Carl, as someone who thinks about these things, what, what, what kind of directions you're leaning towards yourself. Um, but if you'd like me to start, I will. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 well, I, you know, I would, Gosh, now you're putting me on the spot. No, I, I um, it just, it, I am struck by how um, popular, or at least how much press these geoengineering schemes get. You yeah. know that, uh, you know, I guess it's because I'm a science writer, right? and I see, I see how easy it is to to write something where you say, "Hey, everybody, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of all our problems with this, this, you know, brilliant." Uh, new technique and I don't know I'm struck by the idea that, that people have of that you could just go out and fertilize the ocean with iron and that would stimulate uh, you know the uh, growth of some organisms that could uh, take down the carbon but I it, I think that's actually like a real case in point of, of not really thinking seriously about the cycles and the interconnections that you talk about in your book I mean it turns out that a lot of these uh, plankton that might draw down the oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, the carbon dioxide, um, they then get uh, gobbled up by bacteria, which, you know, like the bacteria you're talking about in the soil, they give off a lot of carbon dioxide, so that you don't really, at least from what I've seen, you don't really come out very far ahead in the game. Um, so yeah, 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 you're right about the ocean, uh, because if... This, 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 the CO2 is going into the plankton that are living fairly near the surface. As you point out, if those plankton are eaten by zooplankton and their wastes are gobbled up by the bacteria, and that all happens, most of which that cycle happens in the surface ocean, uh, that's returned carbon into CO2 in the surface. And so the only way to remove it is by is the amount that falls down into the deeper waters, which is only a small fraction of what's photosynthesized at the surface. So I tend to be uh, very much uh, against uh, that scheme because now we're talking about uh, jiggling 
the, the marine ecosystems in, in ways that we really don't understand. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't be jiggling the marine eco- ecosystems anyway on, on those kinds of scales. I mean, to start burying amounts of carbon that are somewhat equal to the fossil fuel releases uh, is, is you know, starting to think about uh, you know, more than doubling the, the, the current flux of carbon into the deep water. And so you know, what's, what, what is that doing to the ecosystems of the ocean? Mm-hmm. I, I think you point out the, 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 the schemes are kind, kind of sexy in a sort of big engineering think kind of way that uh, we, can, uh, we can keep continuing eating our fossil fuel cake because we, we've got these uh, schemes to uh, fix it. Another popular idea of geoengineering, these are called geoengineering, right? Is engineering on an earth, on a planetary scale. Uh, what about the schemes, Carl, to uh, fly mirrors up in space? Yeah, uh, right, the so, mirrors. Yeah, they'll fly mirrors up in space and, and reflect a precisely uh, prescribed, it's almost like a doctor's prescription, like, you know, you, you wear, you know, wear your reflecting lenses and, and stop just the amount of sunlight that you need to come into the uh, that would have come into the planet that you need to reflect back to space before it gets into the atmosphere at all, to counterbalance the extra warming caused by the CO two um, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Okay, that's that's the uh-huh. idea of the mirrors in space. And uh, you know, some people might just object immediately to you know, it sounds you know perhaps just too techy, or we shouldn't be we shouldn't be s- Solving our problem with something else that may lead to other problems. What what kind of problems could that lead to? Hey, flying some mirrors in space it sounds pretty, you know, pretty benign. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 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 one thing I I point out, having thought it through, is that by the time we we do that, because uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, by the time we do that, the Earth's climate is going to have have started to change in in knowable and significant ways. And something that I think is worth thinking about is that some places on the planet are going to perhaps and almost certainly start benefiting from global warming. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, places in the north, you know, maybe Canada is having is having record record agricultural yields, right, from 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 the warmer weather and assuming they get the rainfall. I mean, I'm just saying this hypothetically. I'm not saying they will, but mm-hmm. this has been suggested by more people than me. Mm-hmm. So now what happens, uh, you know, 20, 30 years uh, down the road in which other countries of the, of the world say, gee, we, we need to fly some mirrors in space and return the climate, the, the, the total energy balance of the Earth, uh, or return the global average temperature to the way it was in 1990, let's say. Or, you know, or now who, who's going to say what date we return it to, for one thing. Mm-hmm. And another thing is that uh, now you're now one would be talking about reversing the the climate that may be beneficial to certain places and decreasing agricultural yields in those in those countries. Mm-hmm. And, and so so now certain places in the cooler climate are going to benefit. Certain places are going to be hurt. And so we're really in I see a, a total mess. At, hmm. at, at that time, and we, we the nations can't even agree now very much on on a plan for CO two reductions. Can you imagine trying to agree upon a, a, a master switch, a master um, thermostat, where we should set the master thermostat right. for the planet? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it just uh, it, it seems like it'll be impossible to me to ever to ever get that across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be that would be quite a meeting for to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So, so, so I, I mean, that's mentioned sometimes, but I think uh, mentioned uh, t- too, too. Um, uh, it's neglected, really. Uh, the the, you know, the the assumption would be that everybody would want it, want the climate returned to some kind of state, and we, and it would be you know, clear what that state would be. Mm. Yeah. So it's a real. Yeah. It's a, I mean, we got we have uh, you know the Chinese slogan may you may you live in interesting times. We we, we live in very interesting times. I I am uh, very I am optimistic in the sense that uh, it, we we do have some time to to work this out. Uh, right now, various energy systems are, are are coming online. They're still relatively small, but in certain places like Europe and Denmark, where you've got twenty percent of the electricity coming from from uh, wind turbines, 
I, I, I watched a, a television program the other night on these, these the installations of these giant wind turbines off of Holland, mm-hmm. uh, offshore to get them off the land, and one of these one of these mega construction projects that are going on. I mean, anything we do is going to be massive because energy energy is a massive uh, a massive industry. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, carbon sequestration, not the kind that you mentioned with regarding plankton, but the possibility of putting CO2, let's say, into deep saline aquifers. I mean, some of this is starting to be researched, and I'm really glad with um, with with Obama winning uh, that that there's that at least he's going to be pushing a, a greatly upscaled uh, research program that's probably going to be across the boards of various various kinds of energy systems. And what I think part of my optimism is is not only there's going to be increased uh, research and and there is increased deployment happening right now although to start to start thinking about deploying renewables on a scale that equals today's fossil fuel energy mm-hmm. let's say in the next 30 40 50 years is is is, is mind boggling uh, but we we could do it if we set our minds to it but still mind boggling uh, but the, uh, the the optimism in a sense is that there's also recognition that something needs to be done about energy mm-hmm. uh, that, that that oil uh, is we're, we're probably going to hit a, a a big oil crisis before we hit an equivalently large uh, crisis in, in climate itself, and and doing something at, to replace oil is is going to have to um, be be um, uh, institutionalized. It's going to have to be built. Uh, what route we take could very well help the climate challenge as well, or or hurt it if if we. If the world and the United, I say we in a sense of the United States because uh, we, we have a lot of coal yeah. as does India and China and so if, if we say hey we can start liquefying coal into uh, uh, liquid fuels that could be used in transportation which is the main use for liquid fuels right now of hydrocarbons we could create hydrocarbon fuels from liquid hydrocarbons from coal if we go that route uh, then the the impact on the rising CO2 levels could be even larger unless carbon sequestration is done. And again, that's still in the research stages. We don't really know to, it can, if it can be done to the degree that's going to be necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know if you had seen it, but Obama just had something on, on YouTube, actually. I think he was addressing a, a meeting of governors where he came out pretty, um, pretty hard about... Um, Dealing with uh, dealing with global warming, with some of the things you were just talking about, um, you know, he's not even in office, and he's he's already laying that out as a pretty big priority. So we'll see. Yeah, I didn't that. see that one, Carl, but that's yeah, that that's that's really excellent. We we, we need to be uh, thinking in, in that direction uh, because it, it can't it cannot be done in just four years. This is going to have to be a, a, a decades long project. Really, it's going to be with us the rest of our lives. So the sooner we start, the better, I think. <laughs> uh, especially finding out, you know, like 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 wind turbines, right? I, I, I wind is wind is probably the um, one of the most economical right now of the renewable energy sources. It's 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 close to competing with some of the fossil fuels, and in terms of new construction, that's why the that's why the wind turbines are are, are going up all mm-hmm. all over, and. Uh, People are, are pushing that. Some prominent people are pushing wind. And if you do the calculation, uh, which, I, which I did, uh, and others have coming up, coming up with this number, to start thinking about replacing the United States, the electricity in the United States from fossil fuel with wind turbines, you would need on the order of about a, about a million wind turbines. Wow. And the area that they would cover would be, depending on the size of the wind turbines, but the area that they would cover would be um, something like South Dakota, like the state of South hmm. Dakota, and which is a particularly good place to put them, but it's far from the electrical needs. And I'm not advocating we put them all in South Dakota. It's just a, an example of the kind of aerial coverage. The, the beauty about wind turbines is that they don't really cover all the land. They cover a very small fraction of land. So farms could, could still grow crops uh, under the wind turbines, and you can double the use you can double up on the use of some of the roads for the farms mm-hmm. and the wind turbines, <clears throat> but it is a massive scale. However, we you know we, we, we build millions of automobiles each year. You know, it's, right. we, we, we do we do manufacture on that kind of scale. Of course, I'm I'm covering over the whole problem of the wind being intermittent, uh, 
and the, the need to put it into a form that can be stored. So I'm just, you know, I, I, I admit I'm just covering that up right now. I'm just trying to <laughs> give a, a, a magnitude to, 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 see the, to see the kind of scale that you need yeah. for the, um, to, to, to bring in some of these renewables. Mm-hmm. So on both, you know, it's you know, it's it's good news and bad news. It's not like it's the, it's not the the, we, the planet can do it. Uh, the solar advocates like to point out, and I think it's a really powerful, powerful argument myself that the sun that falls on the Earth is, is something like eight thousand times the flux, the, the power in in the, in the photons from the sun is something that is on the order of eight thousand times the power that is being continually used by. By humanity mm-hmm. to 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 supply itself, so it's a factor of eight thousand to one. So that you know that that's the biggie. But mm-hmm. then th- that's still a lot of area when you when you calculate it out. Like for the United States, uh, you know, if it starts being an area, uh, something like the for for photovoltaic cells, it's something like the you know, the state of Connecticut, you know, your state, which I'm, I'm not going to advocate. We, we we cover your state <laughs> with uh, photovoltaic panels, right. uh, well. but but it's a large it's a large area that would have to be distributed somewhere, and that's going to have ecological uh, impacts. In, in, because with, unlike the wind turbines, the the photovoltaics you actually have to cover, and you don't have to cover continuously. You could mix them, and if they were in the desert southwest, you could in between the rain would be f- more, and you could you could have more vegetation in between the panels. I mean, there's lots of interesting schemes floating mm-hmm. around out there. Uh, you know, nuclear energy step up nuclear energy to start replacing fossil fuel electricity in the United States, then you'd be talking about um, you know, a many-fold increase in nuclear power, and not just uh, another you know, a dozen or so nuclear power plants. And so mm-hmm. then we, we still have the waste problem from the nuclear and the issues of, uh, of, of proliferation of, of radioactive materials. So all, the, uh, the, all these energy forms have their pros and cons, and... We, 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 we really need something uh, that I think uh, Obama is in tune with in terms of some you know, very high-level systems analysis. This is going on. There's, there's many experts out there that have been thinking about this. But to start bringing them into uh, fora, uh, in, in high-level meetings of a continuous nature that are not just going on as, as the occasional international conference or something sponsored by the solar energy or coal industry, but you know, really at very high level, uh, happening at very high level debates on, on these system trade-offs. And we probably should explore many of these options vigorously for a while to start seeing what's going to happen mm. as we deploy these energy sources on the large scales that, are, that they are needed because we yeah. can do them all on very small scales, but to start thinking what the economics are going to be and the, the maintenance problems and the, the various tie-ins to the current electrical grid, which will probably have to be redone, to, to work this all, where we, at least for a while, the, the, these new directions are so relatively small and relatively inexpensive right now because mm-hmm. they're, they're being deployed on small scales. That we should start. Uh, we should start working on them. I mean, for yeah. for example, just to just to go on once more, uh, the the cost of the Iraq War, right? The the mm-hmm. cost of that. We um, you, you know, you start talking about trillion dollars or so. The the projected costs are more, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars already uh, spent. Uh, those kinds of figures could start uh, coming close to replacing the electrical system in the United States with some of these systems that we're talking about. Mm. I'm I'm throwing this out, you know, as a factor of two or three of these things. There's lots of issues that have to be thought about, about the the electrical grids, but, and and then the deployment on that massive scale. But those are the kinds of numbers. So, you know, we, 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 we seem to have that money (laughs) floating around, you know, know, not really, but we do. And Mm. so, you know, we, we, we could have um, made a major impact with, with, Money's like that. We could, with money's like that, we can make a major impact on our current fossil fuel use. Yeah. And and if we don't do it, you know, you know, who's going to do it? Let you know, we in the United States should do it. We we've got the we we've got the high per capita wealth that's being based on fossil fuels and high, and therefore high per capita emissions. We're putting the CO two into the atmosphere. It's going around the world. It the thing about the carbon cycle is that it spreads the CO two equally. This is not. Uh, this is not a, a, a typical pollutant that if you go into a city, oh, you're kind of breathing the exhaust fumes. It's a local thing. You go, in, you walk into the woods. It feels really good. You're in clean air. It's not like acid rain that it's in, in, the, it's in a few 
sort of the 100 miles or 500 miles closest to the emissions, the CO2 spreads equally globally. So the CO2 the United States puts into the atmosphere, or China, or, 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 or Europe, whatever country, or, or, or you or I as individuals, whatever CO2 we put up, up into the atmosphere, that increased greenhouse effect is equal everywhere. Our, our added increased greenhouse effect is, is we're impacting the people in Africa just as much as we're impacting ourselves. And this makes it uh, you know, a really unique environmental uh, problem and something that's going to have to be thought about on a global system. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've been rambling a little bit on the, sort of from one <laughs> idea to the next, Carl, so uh, apologies well, a little bit for that. Well, no, no, uh, hey, it's, 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 it's not a simple question to answer. Um, I mean, we're almost, yeah, we're almost, uh, we've almost been talking for an hour. I guess, um, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I can't resist when I'm thinking about the future of, <clears throat> of, of carbon dioxide and global warming and all, and I'm talking to someone like you who thinks in, in sort of big time scales. I mean, what's going to happen to all this carbon we've, we've, uh, we put in there. What's going to what's going to happen to um, to it? Uh, uh, you know, in, in the thousands of years to come in the future. <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, so the the fossil fuel atoms of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere as CO two uh, that's coming from natural gas and oil and coal, which all contain carbon. There, there are different molecules in those different fossil fuels, but they're all carbon containing and most of the energy we get uh, in burning those fossil fuels comes from the carbon. A little bit comes from the hydrogen, particularly in the methane. Mm -hmm. But they're, um, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, not burn the carbon, basically. The reason we're powering our civilization is because we're creating the CO2 is the reason we're getting energy from those fuels is CO2 is created, created as a low energy form of carbon the carbon was in a higher energy form in those molecules that goes into the atmosphere as CO2 and the average lifetime of, of CO2 in the atmosphere or, or no, excuse me the average lifetime of CO2 yes, let, let, me, let me say that correctly the, the average lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere is about four years Mm -hmm. It's going to go into the ocean or go into land, plants, and then come back out. And so, as I said, even though it's getting di our fossil fuel CO2 is getting diluted, it's getting replaced by other atoms, and so it's going to stay in the, in the biosphere. It's going to stay in this networked system of soil, ocean, atmosphere, and life. Uh. And those carbon atoms are going to stay in for, for about 100,000 years on average. So, in a sense, we're perturbing the carbon dynamics of the biosphere by adding carbon into it, uh, and this is going to be about 100,000 years. Most of the, the atmosphere will not be elevated in CO2 very much for that time period, although it will be elevated a little bit for that time period, but by then some other forces such as the... Uh, ice age cycles or things we don't understand about the Earth system will, will kick in. Mm -hmm. But, but, for, but you know, definitely for the next um, you know, s century, we have significantly elevated CO2 levels. The, the CO2 starts then moving into the ocean, and then when the ocean circulation, especially the, the deep ocean, what they call the deep ocean overturning, so in the, uh, in, in, in the polar regions, the cold water at the surface of the ocean, particularly in wintertime, sinks down, and so there's a large mixing of the ocean in about 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, our CO2 will you know, gradually mix into the ocean uh, over that 1,000-year time scale, and then it'll sort of come to an equilibrium where there'll be a slight amount uh, is still increased in the atmosphere, and that'll slowly incre that'll increase the weathering rates, and it'll, it'll slowly be removed over this 100,000-year time scale. But we are uh, impacting the, uh, the planet for um, you know, many, many decades of significant CO2, uh, higher CO2 levels, even after the fossil fuel era uh, ends. Mm. Mm -hmm. So mm. there, is, there is a kind of a cosmic perspective there. And, and th th these, these carbon atoms that we're putting in now that have coming from the fossil fuels that have, once we're in the biosphere, once hundreds of millions of years ago in most cases, let's say with coal, uh, they were active in the biosphere for about 100,000 years. 
they went out, they've been buried in coal deposits for this hundreds of millions of years, to say an average number. Now we're now we're putting them back into the biosphere. Mm-hmm. They're going to have their their little brief hundred thousand year uh, circuit, circuits and sojourns here in the, in the surface systems and go in and out of various plants, animals, and a lot of going in and out of bacteria, as well as the oceans. And then slowly, in statistically, randomly, uh, over about a hundred thousand year average time scale, they're going to be leaving uh, the biosphere and they'll go out again. And eventually. With plate tectonics, you know, another hundred million years or so from now, they those atoms will, uh, in, including the atoms of our bodies, that will eventually go out. They'll eventually come back into the biosphere about every hundred million years, uh, let's say, and have their hundred thousand year time of activity, being in whatever kinds of forms of life are are currently active on the planet. Mm, whatever is around then. Whatever well, around then. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I guess we've got to jump off the uh, the never-ending carbon cycle at this point. I think uh, I think okay. we've, we've hit about an hour, but this has been great. I mean, thanks so much for for uh, for coming on to Blogging Heads and, and talking about this. It's been it's been really fascinating. Oh, you're welcome, Carl. Very welcome. Good good luck with your work and your 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 questions and your answers that you're continually illuminating with us, uh, illuminating us with with your uh, with your superb writing. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Okay, we'll take care. Bye, Carl.